Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Beyond the Bar podcast. I'm your host, Denise Toba. And today I really have a truly special guest here. Her name is Jessica Tolstead. She is a partner. She's a family law attorney. She's a partner at Berkman, Botker, Newman and Shine. And she specializes in family law. And, uh, you know, the reason why I paused a little bit, because she's also a dear friend of mine, and she has so many layers to her and really um, has had an incredible journey. Um, it is it is a journey that is deeply personal and uh, really just just inspired by by her own challenging upbringing. So it's going to be very insightful conversation. You definitely want to uh, 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 stay tuned. So welcome, Jessica. Oh, thank you for that kind introduction, Denise. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, pleasure all mine. Um, we, we've chatted a little bit and you shared with me about a, a pretty personal and, and traumatic experiences. Um, can you share how they shaped you becoming a, a, an attorney today and, and how it impacts your practice? Sure. So uh, my parents were divorced when I was young. I was uh, 12. And my father um, had uh, drug and alcohol issues. And when my parents were divorced, we lived in Buffalo at the time, and the court system really wasn't um, set up to protect children. And my mom uh, went to a partner when she needed representation. And on the day of court, and I was there, my brother and I were both there, I'm not quite sure why, um, but we were, we sat in the hallway, but on that day, an associate showed up with a blank legal pad, didn't know anything about the, the case, didn't know anything about the, our family or my father. And when um, the judge wanted to order access for my father with us, you know, my mom argued against it and asked it to be supervised because of the drug and alcohol issues. And the judge plainly said, if you don't send your children the next time I see you, you better have your toothbrush. And so access was ordered, you know, there was no attorney for the children at that time. Um, if they were using forensics um, to do um, evaluations for custodial purposes, it, it, they weren't widely used. And, you know, we went once and then the next time uh, he canceled because he had been drinking. And that was that, we never saw him again. He ended up moving away and passing away while I was in law school, but, that day really instilled in me um, a very a deep understanding of how important you know representation is in family law um, and how much of an impact uh, an attorney who's representing a, a, a client and even the court system what a lasting impact they can have on a family and the children and um, that's really why I became a family law attorney uh, you know to to make a difference in you know other people's lives and hopefully be the person that you know, I'm never going to be the person that shows up with an empty legal pad. Um, so that's that's really what got me interested in this area of law. This is this is incredible. How how old were you? Um, oh, how far back do you do you remember that experience in 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 the court? So I was tw uh, about twelve. My brother was uh, around nine, and um, you know it, it was. <laughs> It was difficult because it was, as a child, you're thinking the court system is supposed to protect children. Why would a judge ever order me to be picked up and spend time with, um, you know, a man that's known to have drug and alcohol issues? So it was very confusing in that way. Um, but, you know, it happened and luckily it was only once and then we didn't have to go through it anymore. So it wasn't, it didn't go on for a long period of time, which, you know, I'm very grateful for. Um, but yeah, it really, it, it has impacted my practice though, because, you know, now I have children, but for the first 10 years, even a little bit more that I was practicing, I didn't. And when I would represent um, a woman or a man, especially when they had children and they would be going through difficult custodial issues and they would say to me, well, you don't have kids, so you don't understand. And mm -hmm. at that point I could always say to them, look, I, I don't understand from a parent's perspective because I'm not there yet but I was one of those children. Like, I do understand the gravity and the importance of, of what we're talking about here and, and what, what it means to you as a parent, you know, from a child's perspective. 
And um, I think that helped me with my clients for them to, to understand that I related to their, their situation. And I would imagine that over the years you had to do some work to let go um, of the trauma and, and anger uh, and all of these confusing emotions to sort of uh, clear that right um, out of the way. Um, Otherwise, I would, you know, even speaking from personal experience, when we go through trauma and then we're faced with uh, events which may not be directly related to your experiences, you can still get triggered. Um, yeah. And, and I, yeah. you may have even mentioned that you were almost like you, you're almost doing a sort of a, a, a therapy work without being a therapist. Did I, did I get that right? Yeah. So one of the jokes with matrimonial attorneys is that we are therapists, but we're not licensed to prescribe medication. And, you know, so often what we do day to day, um, while it does have uh, the law is a component of what we do day to day, a lot of this helping our clients navigate the most difficult time in their lives, um, you know, how to handle, to handle certain parenting issues, how to co-parent um, with, uh, you know, a difficult spouse. Um, knowing that they're going to have to be able to effectively co-parent, you know, once we're out of the picture, right? We're not there for the rest of their lives to hold their hand and to ask questions. Um, so I do bring that to my everyday practice. And yeah, we do spend a lot of time um, being more therapists than lawyers, um, although it can be very expensive for people. So when they really, truly need a therapist, we definitely recommend that they see one. You know, and you don't just practice, um, you're not, you know, I think the classic definition or, or maybe not a definition, but sort of uh, in, in people's minds when they're thinking about dissolving their marriage, um, terminating their relationship, I actually call it changing their relationship, especially if they're co-parenting, you know, they may think about, well, the traditional way is you hire your lawyer, I hire my lawyer, um, and let's go litigate, right? It goes to trial and, and judge decides. I, and I understand that you are a huge proponent of mediation, which is a different model. Um, how would you explain that to someone who is contemplating divorce? Yeah, so mediation, thankfully, has taken a, um, a hold in this area in a way that it, it didn't really when I first started practicing. When I first started practicing, I was mostly a litigator. That's not even mostly, I was a litigator. Someone wanted to start a divorce, we filed an index number for an index number, filed the summons and we served the other side. Sometimes there was an attorney on the other side and they would accept service, but you know, we were on our way to the courthouse basically, you know, requesting a preliminary conference. And now, thankfully, so many more people are interested in, in not you know, avoiding litigation, both because it's public and it's very expensive and it's very time consuming. So about 12 years ago, I came to this firm and was trained in mediation and was um, lucky enough to work with under Barry Berkman and spend hours really in mediations watching him and eventually started taking my own cases. And now my practice is entirely made up of um, mediation, collaborative law, and really just out of court negotiated settlements. Um, I also do a, a ton of prenups and postups, but you know, mediation is great. It, um, it enables people to hear not only what the other person is asking for, but why? And it's the why that moves people, right? It's not the, the what. Um, any attorney can communicate the, the go back and forth and, and say, you know, I want the house or I want the retirement account or I want the car. But it's, it's what, why the person wants that and why it's important to them that's motivating. And so I find that the mediation cases in this area in particular, you know, really, really encourage that explanation which helps that people to reach um, a resolution. That's actually very well explained. And I think for many people who may be listening, be like, well, wait a second, I can't even, you know, I can't stand my soon to be ex right now. How are we gonna get to the same room? Mediation doesn't mean basically that you're leaving something on the table, but you're able to get through, through the process oftentimes, uh, you know, practically, faster it, it may be more cost efficient by really understanding the why because you may be stuck on arguing about you take this and i take that and you're stuck but when, if you understand why why it is important to you and you're able just to sort of uh 
you know, let, let go and, and meet somewhere in between. It doesn't have to be in the middle. You really can get through the process faster. So it does not mean that mediation is only for those people who really, really, really like each other and, and get along. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and, and, yeah. and I, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's um, absolutely true. We have people sometimes say to me, well, we don't have an agreement, so we can't mediate as if they could right. only mediate if they come into the process already knowing what they're going to agree to and I'm just going to draft it. And the truth is the majority of mediations, there are no agreements except the agreement to mediate itself, right? And and then we work through it, you know, piece by piece. And it's not a shortcut. Sometimes people are afraid of mediation because they think they're not going to get all of the information. They won't have complete financial disclosure, but that's part of the process. You know, what we want is for everyone to have the same information so they can make informed decisions. You know, and since the essence of the podcast is to bring out a humanness, that's really humanness on both sides, because for you as a practitioner to be such an open book, I think that speaks volume. There's so much strength in you being able to say, hey, look, beyond my title, I am a human being with all these fears and experiences and my own story. And so in front of you, you're sitting um, and you're sitting in front of me and I, and I and I get it. You are going through a very scary process. Um, and, 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 and you may feel a sense of shame and fear, and I understand it. Um, so mm -hmm. by sort of, you, you have the ability to lean into it. And I think that's, that, that is really, uh, a, a wonderful that you're able to do that. And I know that you are also offering, I guess you would call it like a pre-marriage mediation. What, what, what is that? Yes. Yeah, so this was actually an idea that my partner and I discussed, I don't know, it had to have been about 10 years ago. We were at the mediation training together and learning all about mediation. And her and I said to one another during the lunch break, why don't people do this before they get married? Why don't people come in and talk about what type of financial relationship they want during their marriage in advance, right? So much of what we see in divorces is inability to communicate, um, not on the same page with regard to finances, and maybe not even on the same page in terms of what they each envisioned for how they were going to live their their married life, right? Was it to have a child? Is one person going to stay home? Are they both going to work? Um, and so over time, obviously, I needed to learn mediation. I needed to, to get some years behind me really doing it, practicing in this, this area. But I've started this new area within the firm. It's called pre-marriage mediation. And the idea is that people who are thinking about getting married or engaged um, come in and I give like a New York primer, I call it. So I, I explain how their relationship will change according to the law once they get married. And so often people get married and they don't understand that it is a legal relationship, you know, that, 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 it, that is, you know, bound, they're, they're bound by the laws if one of them dies or they get divorced. Um, New York law is going to control what happens. And, um, you know, I get people who come in for a divorce and they'll say, I'll ask about their assets and liabilities. And they, the first thing they say is, well, everything is in separate names. All the assets that I've accumulated during the marriage are all in my own name. And they think, unfortunately, that that means something. And wouldn't it be great if people went into a marriage understanding that that's not what defines a separate asset versus a marital asset? both be on the same page. And the idea is I think that, you know, people are going into marriages now later in life. They already have 401ks, they already have homes, um, they might have a business. And so to really understand how the law is going to impact that relationship before they move forward with it, I think makes the most sense. And maybe it will lead to a prenuptial agreement or maybe it'll just lead to an understanding about how they're going to handle their finances during the marriage, you know, whether they'll have joint accounts or separate accounts, how they'll treat inheritance if that if that comes in and they want to buy a home with it, what that means. Um, if people are making informed decisions, they're going to be better decisions than 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 finding out at the at the end, if God forbid they end up in a divorce, um, what what it means, right? That's not the time to find out. Um, that separate property is only property you acquired before the marriage or by gift or inheritance. Um, and so that's my goal with the pre-marriage mediation um, practice. And I'm very excited about it. It's very practical. 
you know, there's something, I don't know why it has to be such a taboo to talk about either sex or money, uh, because I think it's a lack of communicating about these things. It, it really is, is what, you know, leads down to a disaster. I mean, look, why don't you, uh, you know, exchange uh, credit reports before you say I do? Just make it super transparent. Um, so leading by example, okay, let me ask you this. I know you're married. Um, mm -hmm. What does your financial discussion look like? And what are your financial roles? You know, because sometimes you have somebody who loves the budgeting and the spreadsheets, and then you have the other who's like, eh, I can't stand it, uh, but I'll be in charge of something else. What, how, would you, how would you describe you and your husband with respect to managing your finances? So, you know, it's a little bit of a hybrid. Um, we did not get married until we were in our mid thirties. We already had careers. We already, my husband already had a home. And so we have, we have accounts that are together. We have accounts that are separate. I mean, obviously everything you accumulate during the marriage is marital. Um, but we each have a little bit of our own, you know, control. We will say, you know, if I purchase something on Amazon and want to return it, I'm not messing up, you know, the, the operating account, if you will, for where we pay our mortgage. Um, and then in terms of like payment responsibilities, we'll say it's, it's sort of shared. Um, I think when you get married a little bit later in life, you're used to having control over your finances, how you spend money, how you save money, how you pay your bills. And so gone are the days where people go from their father's home, right, to their husband's home and then, yeah. you know, just yeah. transfers the that responsibility from one to the other, you, know, you already lived a, a significant adult life doing these things on your own. And so I think it makes sense now that more people go into a marriage and they, they sort of divvy up the responsibilities between them um, in a way that makes the most sense for them. What do you guys do when you're disagreeing? How do you handle your disagreements? You know, we don't disagree that often about money issues. Um, or we try general, and talk about things. Yeah, in in general, you know, I will say this. Um, you know, we've been together seventeen years, married for ten, and I really think in the last couple of years is when we've really started to figure things out. You know, figure out ways to talk about things that are more productive, understand um, our personalities, our individual personalities, and sort of what we're bringing to the conversation or what we're lacking, right? And I've really realized that you have to be um, willing to look at your own self and what you're bringing to the table or not bringing to the table in order to be you know, the best partner that you can be. And I think in the beginning years of marriage and then even when your children are young, it's not your focus um, and you don't really understand how um, much of an impact that has on your relationship, but it's, in, it's, it's really what makes or breaks you. It's a lot of work, but you really reap the benefits if you if you put in the time. Yeah, it's like uh, everything worthwhile is 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 worth that work, so to speak, worth the the effort. Um, and yeah, that that is actually that is I, that is so true. You evolve as not only as a couple but also individually. I think it's important that you you grow individually, and you are not the same people you were twenty years ago or seventeen years ago. Um, and you mm -hmm. have a different outlook, different experience. And like you said, communication is super important. All right. Uh, what do you guys like to do for fun when, when you're not working? What do you do? <laughs> when I'm not working. So I love to work out. <laughs> I've recently found F45, which I love. Um, other than that, I usually Peloton and run. Um, we are big skiers. Well, my husband will laugh when he hears that um, because I didn't start skiing until my 30s. And then it was a big hiatus during while well, our children were young. But in the last few years, we've started taking a lot of ski trips in the winter. We go primarily to Gore. We've gotten our kids into it. They now ski better than me. Um, I still will take lessons. But last winter, I skied my first black, which was huge. And wow. um, now, now we'll say I do more. I ski more blues than greens, which is really huge for me <laughs> because I was firmly in the green category and not looking to ever get out of it until I saw my kids and how much fun they were having. And, um, you know, with a little poke, they were poking and prodding me and calling me, you know, a baby, <laughs> thumbs on the green. I was like, okay, I need to get out of my comfort zone and take some lessons. And so that's one of the things we do in the winter that I absolutely love. It's my favorite uh, family vacation.
competition. Ski all day, you get that athletic, um, you know, type of uh, feeling at the end of the day, you've done something really, really, really meaningful. And then pajamas and dinner and bed. <laughs> Yeah, that's it, right? <laughs> that's all you have yep. the energy for. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that sounds like fun. So you graduated yeah. from the, the the pizzas and the French fries on the little bunny hills, and now next, what is it, helicopter skiing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever get there. <laughs> but um, I'm definitely doing better than I thought I ever would. And um, it's nice to all ski together. So I'm really glad yeah. I took that leap because I was very afraid and not, did not want to get out of my comfort zone, but there's nothing like children to really encourage you um, when you know you could do something yeah. all as a group um, to, to, to move you out of your comfort zone a little bit. Oh yeah, no excuses, I know, <laughs> you don't have a choice. Wow, well, Jessica, it's been an incredible, incredible joy to have you here and to hear your story and really, you know, understand the depth of, of your experiences. And again, I'm, so grateful and i'm sure our viewers and listeners as well that you are so transparent and just just the authenticity just just shines thank you so much for uh for joining us today oh well thank you so much for having me this was my pleasure and for everyone listening and watching today, you can learn more about Jessica Tolstead and how to get a hold of her by clicking on her bio link below. And do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Beyond the Bar Podcast, and make sure that you follow us on all social media channels with the links posted below. Until next week, stay curious and stay inspired.